The FNAF DLC is fast approaching. Kind of. Maybe. <laughs> but the question we're all left asking is what exactly will this DLC entail? Will there even be a DLC? At this point, when it comes to FNAF, we have no idea. Mostly because the series is in an incredibly weird place currently. With seemingly no official successor after Scott, where could Steel Wool take the story to have it make more sense? And will that direction involve the game's secret main antagonist, Burn Trap? That's what we're exploring today. Just like with any of these possible DLC videos, whether it be about the Choose Your Guardian concept or Glamrock Bonnie's return, we first need to check to see how possible it is with where we end up at the end of the game. Well, as far as, as we can, since the Pizzaplex, or at least part of it, seemingly gets destroyed at the end of the true ending. So, when we choose to stay, is it possible for Burn Trap to have more of an impact? Well, it's not as clear as you might think. See, Burn Trap, at this moment, is sat in the FNAF 6 pizzeria that's underneath the Pizzaplex, charging in his charging station. However, he only seems to come out of it when ourselves along with Gregory jump down into the final area. So to make this DLC possible, well, we would have to have him wake up for some other reason. Now technically it's unknown if when we drop down Afton ironically wakes up at the same time or if we triggered it somehow, but given that it's FNAF, I'm guessing that us triggering it is more probable and more in line with what the series story was intended to be. So for this DLC, to include him, Afton would need to wake up for some other reason, be it maybe a power surge or something that messed with his power supply or potentially gave him a boost that he needed to get out of the charger early. Now that Afton is out of his charger for whatever reason, assuming that that's where the story goes, what could the possible DLC stories be? Well, I'm guessing that Burn Trap would somehow be able to get back into the Pizzaplex, despite Freddy telling Gregory that the elevator would only be good for one trip. But who knows, maybe that's because of Gregory and Freddy's weight combined or something like that. Maybe with just Afton in it, it would be able to make more than one trip, since after all, it is how the animatronics were getting down to dig the tunnel in the first place, right? Anyways, Afton probably would get back up and then start roaming around the pizza plaques, probably corrupting anything that he could. This would probably lead to another ending where we would either defeat Burntrap in the pizza plex or then maybe have to lure him back down into the basement. But in my eyes, in my mind, I think that we should have to lure him down to the parts and service room. Mostly because Vanessa told us to come to the main stage once we got into the elevator when trying to escape after you get Roxy's eyes. But if you listen to Vanessa, then go check the stage. There's nothing there for you. It just seems to be a time waster so that Moondrop has a better chance of getting you. But in my eyes, this seems like more of a game mechanic thing than an in-game thing. Like in the game universe, all you would need to do to catch you is just make it to you instead of waiting until it's exactly one hour. So, there would have to be some reason that she called you there in the first place, right? Well, maybe it's because that's where Burn Trap was, and now we gotta bring him down to parts and service to dismantle him and end his spree for good. Maybe we can get some main antagonist action where the animatronics roaming the Pizzaplex are instead replaced with the main villains of Burn Trap and Vanny. Kind of like Nightmare Fredbear, Nightmare, or Nightmare Eon style, since those characters also replaced all of the villains in FNAF 4 when they were out. This would definitely make Vanny and Burn Trap seem more powerful and important than the other animatronics. As especially if this only happened once we destroyed all three. Since then, we would assume that they were kind of tossed aside or forgotten since they didn't really work anymore. And I think that this would also help Burn Trap be more menacing, because honestly, looking at him, this is the scariest design for Afton yet. This is the most terrifying version of Springtrap that we have ever had, and we don't actually have to or get to interact with him directly. We don't have a reason to really be scared of him. He doesn't chase us, he doesn't have any real power over us, we burn him from a distance through monitors while pressing buttons, and he only tries to take control over Freddy instead of coming after us. Which is what helped us think of this character as a waste. But having him chase us around the Pizzaplex would be an excellent way of making him more unique and terrifying, especially if periodically he would cause us to be forced out of Freddy while trying to take him over. And the only way that we could save Freddy would be maybe to press another button at a save station, or maybe try to activate a save 
station or something like that. Something that could possibly jam Afton's frequency or signal or something along those lines. Making Afton a bigger villain would definitely be a better way to go in my eyes, because this man was underused and really kind of wasted in this way. Especially if they do decide to kill him off permanently, since now he's just sentient code after having his soul burnt out of FNAF 6's fire. But having him chase us around the pizza plex and making the Freddy Mac useless at times and really just being a horrifying antagonist would really help sell how terrifying this version was intended to be. And something I feel should have been in the base game, since, you know, he's the most iconic character in the entirety of the FNAF series, you know, purple guy, the main killer. Something that was teased in the very first trailer and then yet maybe had five minutes of screen time, unless you're bad at the game like I am, and then in that case he had like 30 minutes to an hour of screen time. And don't even get me started on how horrible his death was if that was even a death. Killing this man off screen is probably the rudest thing I think Scott could do to me. Like, I want to see this man, and this man being William, die. I want to be the one who causes it. I want to see the light leave his eyes. I want to see that last bit of code float into the air with this demonic purple eyes and then dissipate. Okay, I want to watch him suffer. It's the least that he deserves. Plus, with Burn Trap and Vanny roaming the pizza plex, maybe we could actually figure out what happened to those other missing kids that potentially drew us to the pizza plex to begin with. I mean, Vanny says in the first trailer that they're supposed to be our friends, right? Like, I don't know, maybe she got to Gregory's orphanage or like kind of like raided it with a bunch of animatronics man like a like a world of warcraft raid but with animatronics i don't know like maybe this is the way that vanny's room above phaser blast would be open for closer inspection without the phaser blast ending button maybe there's an additional secret room or a duffel bag or like a present with some story lore that points to what really happened to those kids and then we can actually go and try and figure it out if they were killed maybe or kidnapped or used to fuel Afton. I mean, this could be a really good way for the story to really establish itself since, you know, the game was released unfinished despite being a couple years late. Maybe something like this was always intended, but since there were so many delays, we had to deal with an underused and hardly terrifying antagonist despite the ability to make him so much more. But then again, maybe I'm just enthusiastic and expecting too much from these games, which may or may not be a bad thing. In a 10, Princess Quest. This is a theory that I truly believe and that I'm pretty sure has been all but officially confirmed. Vanessa is certainly the princess that we play as in Princess Quest, since the game was used to lock her away in the first place, both in Help Wanted as well as in the first version of the game in Security Breach, which is just a recreation of the one that we play in the Help Wanted mobile port. To further solidify this connection, there are lore bags mentioning how Princess Quest is an arcade machine that for some reason was ported to that medium from mobile, and they couldn't figure out why. So this is clearly the game that we dealt with in Help Wanted, and since we play as Vanessa in Help Wanted, it only makes sense that Vanessa is once again the princess that we're playing as, who inevitably gets caught by Glitch Trap. And then we have to fight our way back into our body, as indicated by the sword we get in chapters 2 and 3. The biggest piece of evidence here is the final door. That is in essence a, an exact 16-bit replica of the door that we get shut behind in the true Help Wanted ending, which again, we do as Vanessa. So it's not has to be. Stop saying that. In at 9, relationship. Gregory, our player character in the game, is certainly a mysterious kid. And Vanessa, the night security guard who's also Vanny, is just as confusing. But at least we know more about her story, being our player from FNAF VR. But what the most mysterious thing about this game is, is the relationship between Gregory and Vanessa. Like, what the heck is up with these two? Vanessa spends the whole game trying to lock Gregory in the security room, and then Vanny comes to kill us, as she does in the worst ending. But then, after curing her, we don't even ask questions, we just go eat ice cream on a hill with her. So if we're so quick to do that, then there's no way she's a stranger. It genuinely seems like their family, which 
would explain why he knew something was off with her, but she can't be his mother or sibling because when she locks us in the security office, she tells us that we'll wait until your parents or the police arrive. If it was a sibling, she would have said our parents or even mom and dad, but with her saying your parents, that means that they aren't hers, making our options limited. And she's definitely not our mom, since if she was, she would have said your father. Which is weird because she also seemingly doesn't know Gregory's name until it starts coming out of his faz watch. Or at least that's how she says that she knows his name to Freddy in Parts and Service, but then she could have been lying. And it ain't aware. Now we may believe that Vanessa is unaware of her dual personality, that, that it would make sense if she blacks out while William takes over as Vanny, or however this weird pseudo possession thing works, I don't know, it's sentient code possessing a human. I, all normal bets are out the window. However, that is not the case at all. As we learn from CD number 11, it doesn't matter what order you find these endgame CDs in, you just need to find 11 of them and you are able to hear this. And we get our first indication that Vanessa is truly Vanny, at least first indication from the tapes. About halfway through this tape, the therapist says that's true. So on your breaks, it looks like you were shopping for a con costume. You purchased some fake fur material. What are you going to make? Then Vanessa mutters indistinctly. You can't really make out what she says. And then the therapist replies with, what was that? Did you say the costume is a secret? Why is that? To which Vanessa replies, I can't talk about this. He said he would always be watching. He could be here or there or anywhere in between. That line of he said he would be watching surely means that she has some idea about what's going on. Especially when she's openly talking about how she has plans on making a costume, or at least mutters about it. So if she's aware but doesn't fight it, does that mean that she's accepted Afton as a part of her? Possibly. And it's seven connections. Now, whether or not she knew about this, Vanessa's recommendation for the night guard position came from the top of Fazbear Entertainment, which does end up confusing plenty of people in the administration, as we learned about from various duffel bags. She has no security experience, and she was transferred from another part of the company. But nevertheless, she still got the job, despite multiple people saying that they wouldn't go forward with hiring her. Which, honestly, let's be let's, let's be real here, probably led to their deaths. So, who on earth is? the one ordering her promotions. Seemingly, we have no idea. We could assume that it's William, but he's currently plugged into a charging station in the basement, so it would have to be someone who knew her, knew Afton's interest in her, made her a VR tester so that she could get possessed, and then made her a security guard so Afton could get her to do what he needed. But who could that possibly be? When I have a solid answer, I'll be sure I'll let you know. <laughs> And at 6, CRT effect. Now while most of the mystery surrounding the CRT effect we get on our screen when Vanny is around is directed at Gregory currently, like why does he see it like that, the bigger question in my opinion is why does Vanny cause that effect? We see it happen to the security cameras as well that the therapist describes to client 46, because she's only human, Vanny is only a person. There is no real reason for her to cause these sort of effects. Like yes she has some form of sentient code possessing her, somehow, but by no means should there be a reason why she is causing the cameras to screw up when she's near them, including Gregory's eyes. It explains why the animatronics can't see her, or why Freddy at least can't see her until he gets Roxy's eyes, but while the camera effect explains things, it still needs to be explained, because there is seemingly no way that it should actually be possible. Sentient code possessed or not, because either way, she's human. She bleeds when she falls down, or at least she should, but given that the game is designed for kids to be able to play it, um, there isn't really any blood, but still, she should only be human, right? How if you went to number 5, Client 46. Some people believe Gregory to be the mysterious Client 46, such as myself, able to be found in the retro CDs available at the end of the game, using Roxy's eyes. However, others suggest that perhaps this Client 46 is Vanny, since Vanny is an alternate persona of Vanessa, and Vanessa is her only other client with retro CDs in the game. Client 46 doesn't talk, but is adept at hacking, something we at least before the game came out associated with Vanny. However, I have a few issues with this theory. I don't know if therapists dealing with DID or dissociative identity disorder would classify other personalities as separate clients, since I'm pretty sure sentient code possessed humans wouldn't really be expected, even in the FNAF world, at least by the people in the FNAF world, so any therapist would most likely classify this as a case of DID. And I'm not sure if they classify other personalities as other clients, or if it's like the same client number but different notes. 
There's also the fact that Client 46 is seen talking to someone in a bunny costume, or at least the costume itself. However, the cameras are glitching out, indicating that the bunny is Vanny. And also the fact that Vanessa leaves in disc 12, or around disc 12 at least, and 46 doesn't end until disc 16. And at 4, Afton. In the best ending, there are quite a few confusing moments. The most confusing one for me at least is the idea that Gregory would go get ice cream with Vanessa once she's done trying to kill him. Like, why would you do that? Some seem to think that it's because they're related, or representing the dead Afton kids. And thanks to MapHat, there's a little more evidence to this. The ice cream that Vanessa gets while on the hill is very reminiscent of the ice cream cone that gets Elizabeth lured into baby's arm grabbing or scooping range or however you want to say it. The cone with the tall soft serve on top kind of looks like the cone with the soft serve on top that baby presents to Elizabeth in order to lure her closer and then subsequently kill her. Is that evidence or just a coincidence? No idea whatsoever, but it's FNAF, so I'm going with it ain't a coincidence. Especially because Crying Child also has ice cream that could be symbolic. So, that's a little too many coincidences, in my opinion. Getting close to the end, in number three, Sacrifice. There's a theory that Gregory from this game is intended to be a robotic version of Crying Child, which in all honesty, makes sense. However, if this is the case, we can build off this, and maybe suggest that the real intention behind this game wasn't to bring William back in any capacity, but rather to make Gregory, his son, Son, more like him by sacrificing Vanessa. Now, for some reason, everything seems to work out for Gregory, right? Despite going about this in what is probably the worst way possible, since staying in Freddy's room again would probably have been the winner's choice, Gregory doesn't end up dying this entire time. And in one ending, he even stays so that he can kill Vanny and put an end to the missing children. However, honestly speaking, this just feels all kinds of wrong to me. Like, why did Vanny disassemble Freddy, but then leave the controller on the desk instead of taking it with her when she went to chase Gregory? And why even worry about chasing him yourself when you have f***ing robots that can grab him for you? This all seems like too many coincidences, especially for a FNAF game, which could be why this ending is required for the Princess Quest ending. Symbolic reasons. He can choose to be good or choose to be evil in this moment. And Afton was fine with sacrificing Vanessa. I'm pretty sure about that. And ultimately, in a number two, two Vannies. The rooftop ending is unlocked by exiting the pizza plex through the prize counter and then clicking leave. This will prompt Freddy to burn the place to the ground and the two of you can go escape onto the roof. I don't really know what Freddy's original plan was. I guess maybe you just go down the fire escape. But when Gregory gets to the roof, Vanny is seemingly there waiting for us. Somehow. She grabs us, but then Freddy, with his new eyes, sees Vanny and jumps off the roof with her, causing them both to fall. They both seemingly die, and we take off Vanny's mask, revealing Vanessa behind it. We look confused, and then the comic ends. However, before actually ending, another couple panels are shown, with Vanessa standing up on the rooftop looking down at what happened. This is probably one of the most confusing endings in the game, since it shows us that there are apparently two Vanessas. And while we seemingly knew about the whole double life thing, we hadn't really exactly seen these two characters in the same room, so we thought that they were one and the same. And in the Princess Quest ending, we seemingly save Vanny. The simplest answer to that is that there may not be two Vanessas, but could simply be Vanessa's soul looking down on her body. We know that souls are actually things in this universe thanks to FNAF 3's cutscenes where a purple guy gets spring trapped, and those souls had physical forms that caused him to freak out. So this could just be Vanessa regretting all the things that she did as Vanny, hence the fire because Remnant supposedly needs fire to burn. And finally, in a number one, Vanny's ending. In the canon ending to this game, the one where we fight against William Afton in the form of Burn Trap, in that that ending, we don't really see what happens to Vanny. While yes, Burn Trap might have been dealt with, we don't know if this releases Vanny or if she's still under his control. Plus, we don't know just what she was actually doing when all this went down. When there's a canon ending to a game, you expect the main antagonist of the game to be there, right? So like, when Freddy and Gregory are just sitting on that hill, chilling in Cedar Rapids, what comes next for the series? This is a question I genuinely just don't have an answer to, and I don't think I could have one, because there are so many possibilities now that I think it's practically impossible for me to guess. And I think that's the point. Since there's someone taking over from Scott for the next game, I'm sure that Scott wanted to leave them with the ability to go wherever they wanted to next, whether that be with William as the main villain, hence his physical form, god I hope not, Vanny being the villain, hence her not being there in the end, or just the blob, since, you know, it was introduced and then intended to be revealed in the Final Passport Fights book, but then delays made the whole thing 
inevitable. Yeah, okay, you, you get it, all right? <laughs> That's my guess as to why the ending is so obscure, but still, what happened to Vanny? No clue. Now, based on the points I made last time, there are a few things that we need to go over. Firstly, the breaking and entering does not apply in the actual game, but can come into play later on. He is 100% trespassing, though, despite being locked inside. He actively hid inside of Freddy, in, like in his stomach, instead of leaving the pizza plex, which would make this trespassing. Every time I mention stealing, like in the merch, the security badges, even Freddy, there's no arguing that. He does in fact steal those. The main argument against these is that, well, he needs to do this to survive, which is blatantly not true. Okay, Freddy informs Gregory that the doors will reopen at 6 a.m. All Gregory needs to do at that point is just stay in Freddy's green room or the area behind it until 6. Nothing else was necessary in order for him to survive. The only problems occur when Gregory tries to get out sooner. He causes his own problems. Vanny only ends up knowing Gregory is in the Lost and Found because she put him there as Vanessa. So, with that logic in mind, Vanny would not have known that Gregory was in Freddy or Freddy's green room. He says that himself. And Vanessa does not check inside Freddy when you approach while piloting him. So as far as the argument that he needed to do this to survive, no he didn't. Unless he ends up making the problems himself, which would completely destroy his case. So, glad we got that settled. One of the other points of contention was really everything else he did was in self-defense. He had to destroy the animatronics, he had to kill Vanny in the phaser blast ending, otherwise they would have killed him. But while self-defense does sometimes justify killing in order to protect yourself or your loved ones, this is, this is typically used for human-on-human -human interaction. Interactions. Human on robot interactions wouldn't necessarily fall under self-defense. The animatronics would have to be proven that they didn't intend to harm Gregory, and this could be done using code analysis and camera footage. However, we know that the animatronics were hacked, and whoever Client 46 is did the hacking. Now, if Client 46 is Gregory, which in the context of this world, they would know, and the evidence seems to actually point to, the fact that the animatronics were after him could could be seen as his fault since he actually disturbed their original programming. This is also where the footage of him in the Pizzaplex would have come out, particularly the image where he was talking to someone with rabbit ears, thus showing the jury that Gregory and Vanny had a personal relationship, further hurting his case. Gregory by no means had to destroy the animatronics, he chose to do it. Freddy even asks him not to. Gregory didn't do it because he had to, he did it because he wanted revenge. He even says it himself, quote, they get what they deserve. He was destroying them for revenge and to get the parts for Freddy, not so that they wouldn't hurt him. Since after all, they can still come and kill him after he destroys them. So he does destroy property because he wanted the animatronics to suffer, not because he had to in order to be safe again. Again, could have just hidden Freddy's room or somewhere else. People are also saying that he's homeless, so he has to steal. Firstly, homeless or not, it's still illegal to steal. And secondly, I don't think that he needs Roxy balloons, action figures, and stuffed characters in order to survive another day. I'm not saying that he shouldn't keep himself alive, I'm just saying that he's what he's doing is illegal. Which is true, no matter who you are. And anything I included in those numbers was not a story item, and instead the extra items that you do not need in order to beat the game. And you didn't need to steal Freddy at all. There is no justification for him running off with Freddy other than the fact that they're friends. But then again, it's grand larceny and illegal. One commenter decided to try and provide legal defense for Gregory, in a lighthearted manner because that was also the point of the video. So I'd like to reply to Jason Ross's defense for the theft of security badges. Quote from his comment, while this is technically a crime, I think he could make a strong case with any halfway decent lawyer that he did so out of necessity. He stole stuff to help further his attempts to escape unlawful confinement and other crimes committed against him. Stealing those items he stole was necessary to save himself. He would never have survived the night if he didn't steal. First of all, you just outright admitted that it was a crime, which an actual attorney would have torn to shreds. Secondly, like I've been saying, he could have been hiding the entire time, okay? He would have survived if he had just hid until 6. He doesn't escape any sooner than 6 a.m. You progressing throughout the game just makes the time go to 6. He never escapes sooner. He did not have to steal the security badges. Unlawful confinement, as you said, is described as whoever wrongfully restrains a person as to prevent that person to move beyond a certain restricted limit is said to have committed the offense of wrongful confinement. However, nobody restrains Gregory, literally, as well. Like, they don't actually like timed anything. He gets himself locked in the pizza plex. Nobody locked him in there intentionally. The doors close automatically at midnight, and 
he had plenty of time to leave, but didn't, and he chose to climb inside Freddy. Which also ruins your argument against trespassing, which was also wrongful confinement. And for all intents and purposes, in the eyes of the law and any outsiders, Vanessa was actively trying to help him. There are recordings of her claiming to have called the police, which would have been verified certainly, but even if she had called them and claimed something else, the record of her calling 911 would be there. Most of Ross's case relies on unlawful confinement, however, staying in somewhere and then wanting to leave does not constitute unlawful confinement. And to the public, Vanessa was trying to help get him home, but he was avoiding her. We know that she was trying to kill him, but the public doesn't. Now for the biggest issue that everyone seemed to have with this list. The one that I'm sure y'all clicked on this video for. The claim that killing Vanny was murder and not self-defense. And this claim is really the reason I wanted to make this video, because I can't reply to every single comment that was referring to this, okay? Self-defense can be a defense to an assault, battery, and criminal homicide because it always involves the use of force. Most states have special requirements when the defendant uses deadly force in self-defense. Deadly force is defined as any force that could potentially kill. An individual does not have to actually die for the force to be considered deadly. Examples of deadly force are the use of a knife, gun, vehicle or even bare hands when there is a disparity in size between the two individuals. Or, in this case, the use of animatronic robots to kill Vanny, as Gregory does in the Phaser Blast ending. Which would also set a precedent for robots being counted as deadly force. To successfully claim self-defense, a defendant must prove four elements. First, with exceptions, the defendant must prove that he or she was confronted with an unprovoked attack. Second, the defendant must prove that the threat of injury or death was imminent. Third, the defendant must prove that the degree of force used in self-defense was objectively reasonable under the circumstances. And fourth, the defendant must prove that he or she had an objectively reasonable fear that he or she was going to be injured or killed unless he or she used self-defense. The model penal code defines self-defense as justifiable when the actor believes that such force is immediately necessary for the purposes of protecting himself against the use of unlawful force by such other person on the present occasion. Okay, so I'm willing to admit that the attack was certainly unprovoked. Vanny did not need to come after him in order to get him out of the pizza plex. However, that second issue, the proof of threat of injury or death was imminent, is where things get complicated. At no point in the game does Vanny directly threaten Gregory with any words. Her voice lines include, see you soon, disassemble Freddy, there you are, are you having fun yet, laughter, and let's have some fun. While menacing, none of these involve a direct threat. At no point in the game does she brandish a knife or even send the security bots after Gregory to disassemble him. She only sends the three main ones to collect him, who also make no appearance in this ending, therefore do not count. Yes, when she catches us, we get a game over screen, but that's just us losing the game. That isn't necessarily us being killed. Us thinking that we get killed is simply an assumption because we don't see what happens next. However, in this case, since we made it to the end, Gregory had never been caught by Vanny. While yes, she does end up destroying an animatronic, it was just an animatronic. That's not really a threat on Gregory. Now, let's skip point number three for a minute and then move on to point number four. That the defendant must prove that he or she had an objectively reasonable fear that he or she was going to be injured or killed unless they used self-defense. While yes, Gregory is a child or seemingly a child who would have a more extreme view of the world, he literally spent six hours running and hiding from Vanny, where he ended up surviving. In fact, he was right at the pizza plex door to leave, but instead, Instead, instead of leaving, he chose to go after Vanny, thus turning this act of possible self-defense into a possible act of vigilantism, or even turning Gregory into the aggressor. He and Freddy went to confront Vanny, he says himself, maybe that they can catch her in her room at Phaser Blast. Gregory could have left and survived, but chose not to, meaning that he cannot claim self-defense in an altercation that he created. And now for the final point. The defendant must prove that the degree of force used in self-defense was objectively reasonable under the circumstance. Now, being a child, there is a leeway as to what would, like, what he would deem reasonable force, but in this case, it is absolutely not reasonable force. We see how destroyed Freddy is after he gets disassembled, okay? His chest and torso are gaping open. He had his insides ripped out. And then, he even ends up, like, dying in an animatronic sense, even though his body and his head have been shown to work separately. And then, Gregory orders the same thing done to Vanny, a human 
who would be alive as the animatronics ripped her ribs and intestines from her body. Does that sound reasonable to you? Because killing in self defense is easiest to claim when the death you cause is quick or painless. But Vanny suffered and suffered hard. Even criminals on death row do not get this treatment. A serial killer with more kills than Vanny would just get the simple two dose lethal injection, where the first dose actually is intended to dull the pain of the second dose. Under absolutely no circumstances would Vanny being torn apart so badly that the comic panels won't even show it be considered the proper amount of force. Especially when he could have said anything to stop or break or even kill. He could have just said kill. This is absolutely over the top, especially given that Gregory seems to have known her if he is indeed Client 46, which is also hinted at during the Princess Quest ending, but since that's a different ending, that doesn't really count here. Which, it, if he was Client 46, that would have appeared in court. So what kind of charges in juvenile time is Gregory facing because of this? Well, if Gregory uh, had Mac Murdock as a lawyer, let's say, or as someone who's also a really good lawyer, they could possibly argue that this would rather be manslaughter than murder. However, Gregory knows what disassemble means, so an argument that this was an accident would be very tough to pull off. But looking at the minimum sentence, there are three possible outcomes for how he'd be treated. One, the child is so young or mentally incompetent to not understand what they've done and are excused for criminal and civil liability from their actions. Not the case for Gregory, who knew full well what was going on the entire time throughout this game. Two, the child is old enough to understand what they have done, but not old enough or lacking in evidence of sufficient premeditation to charge them as an adult, so they are charged and tried as juveniles, which could be the case for Gregory and is the most likely outcome. And then three, the child is old enough to understand what they have done and there is evidence of planning and premeditation such that they can be deemed to have acted as an adult might, and they are charged as an adult, with the exception that minors may not be sentenced to death. Now, this could be the way that the courts decided to go, since after all, Gregory did intend on confronting Vanny, since he could have left the pizza plex but instead went after her. If he is Client 46 as well, the images of him breaking into the pizza plex before could be interpreted as premeditation, especially if he was investigating the pizza plex because of Vanny. The state could also argue that his intention was always to kill her. So, with these rules in mind, we will look at a minimum and maximum sentence. The minimum would be a manslaughter charge. However, unlike murder, manslaughter does not carry an automatic sentence of life imprisonment. It remains, however, an opinion for the court. But looking at the situation, things wouldn't look too good for Gregory. A nine-year sentence, which is not uncommon, would allow the offender to be paroled after serving three years of their sentence. If a firearm is involved in the offense, though, a minimum sentence of four years is required. And while the weapon was not a firearm, it could be argued that since she was a distance from him, that it could also be considered similar. So at least Gregory would be looking at three to nine years for manslaughter. If he was charged with murder, however, he would absolutely be tried as an adult. And since this is the worst case, we'll go with first degree murder since the court could consider this planned and deliberate. Those convicted of first degree murder all receive the same sentence. Life imprisonment with parole eligibility after 25 years. A 20 year old convicted of first degree murder will be eligible for parole at the age of 45. And if they behave themselves, then they're likely to receive parole. But considering Gregory's personality and your comments on that top 10 video, I, I doubt that he'd like admit responsibility show remorse. He doesn't seem like that kind of person. Although, after 25 years, he may start looking at things differently. With new eyes, if you will. This is also if he ends up actually aging because he's a real human and not a robot like we're all thinking. And like, if he doesn't age, a whole new investigation is gonna happen, so uh, let's, let's not get into that. The concept of Burn Trap has been annoying me since I first learned of his existence. Since it seemingly exists separate from Glitch Trap. Up until this point, we were running under the assumption that William's body finally ate it in the FNAF six fire, but that his soul ended up latching onto a hard drive that got scanned into Help Wanted, which is how Glitch Trap was born. Because William was able to use the agony from the fire to keep on living and finally become a spirit, something like that. But with some of William's body still being in this suit, what the hell is going on here? That's what we're exploring and aim to answer today. And you know what? I think I did. The main issue I've been having is whether William is dead or alive. And there are a couple different things to consider here. Firstly, he is seemingly in a new endoskeleton, which would indicate that he's dead and Glitch Trap's consciousness is just being transferred into Burn Trap spot via the recharge station. But his head is clearly visible. Like, you can see his skull and his actual human jaw, meaning that he could still be holding on to this world via that head, especially given who we're talking about here. The most stubborn 
bastard to ever grace our screens. This also can't be a new endo. And just the model that they're using for the others since it was easier and they could release the game faster. This seems to be indicated by the way that burn track walks. If this was a new endoskeleton, why would he be shambling like a zombie? But the claws and repaired sections to the actual endo also seem to indicate that this is also a new endo and possibly even Glamrock Bonnies. So there's a whole lot of wrong going on here. There, all the points are intersecting and it's not fun. Originally, I was against the whole Glamrock body endoskeleton thing because, well, frankly, the body in the suit kind of disproved it for me. But I think I might have found a way to make it work. However, looking at the model, I'm still not 100% sure. If this was the Glamrock Bonnie endo, it would need to have broader shoulders and actually be shorter. Like even scaling the Glamrock endo so that they're the same height, the endos when posed the same and lined up, just they don't match. There are similarities of course between the two designs, but there aren't enough similarities where I can call this even really above 50%. There's also the issue of the muscles being woven throughout the body, or maybe those are nerve fibers. If it was just the head, I'd understand, since they could have just pulled the old endo head and put it onto the new body, since all the parts were intertwined, Afton's head would have come with it. But with the muscles throughout the rest of the endo, that's way too intricate to actually have been placed there. And they would only be there and not dangling if it had been stuck there after being shoved full of machine parts. I don't think that they're taking super glue to glue these fibers back onto a new endoskeleton. If Afton was going to transfer his head to a new endo, it wouldn't come with the rest of his body bits. It just, it wouldn't. That's not how it works. Which would mean this would have to be Springtrap's endoskeleton. Which also explains why it's so run down, why he shambles, and why he hardly has any casing. And Springtrap's design also seems to change from game to game. From FNAF 3 to FNAF 6, he was totally different. So him changing again in Security Breach seems like no big deal in comparison. It's basically normal for him to get a newer and seemingly scarier attempt at his design with a new game. And at least this has an understandable progression from the last game and even from FNAF 3 since it's more run down and not just a bigger head like Scrap Trap. It's like he sold his soul for a bigger head and then the demon kind of made a joke out of it. The most reasonable assumption that I have for what happened though was that he was given the hands of Glamrock Bonnie since it has the claws and just he wasn't given the entire endoskeleton. But then again, his arms have have the bits of muscle and nerve fibers as well, which means that it would have to have been his old one, it would have to have been there from the start, it would have to be the arm of the old endoskeleton, which is a whole other conundrum because Scrap Trap was missing an arm and Spring Trap didn't have any casing on his foot, yet here we are. I just think that we have to kind of leave this one up to artistic license and accept that it's meant to be the same endoskeleton, just with a replacement part or two from Glamrock Bonnie instead of like the entire endoskeleton. It makes sense, honestly, and it's really the only reasonable explanation that we have. Unless the colors are wrong on the images that I was looking at and the bits on the hands are just meant to be melted casing, which is possible, but I, I, I doubt it. As for if he's wanted dead or alive, I think this version of Afton is actually finally dead. And honestly, I'm happy about that because it means that even if he's still here, we can kill him off for good. This is the most logical conclusion to me because, well, other than him basically being only a head, this guy has had multiple backslides of, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> Just kidding. And this time around, while we instantly predicted that he had indeed survived, I think that Scott is finally flipping the narrative on us. We predicted it, so it's not gonna happen. Afton is no longer connected to his body, as we can clearly see from the formation of Glitch Trap. And Glitch Trap being created would only be possible if Afton died, since the one you should not have killed was dead set on keeping him breathing. But Burn Trap, this guy doesn't even have lungs anymore. So yeah, this version of Afton's body is dead, but his consciousness lives on. Like how there's like the conspiracy that Walt Disney froze his head. Yeah, well, that's kind of what they did with Glitch Trap. And then that programming was probably uploaded into his old host or I guess vessel since I've been rewatching Supernatural. Basically, this guy would be impossible if he wasn't just Afton's code loaded onto an endoskeleton. Plus, the eyes are clearly robotic this time around with purple pupils rather than the previous iterations that had seemingly real eyes, Afton's actual eyes, since it was in suit mode after he got snapped and opening his head in those like secret FNAF 
three screens revealed that it was actually like his eyes because they were seemingly in the same place. So, all in all, here's the story of Burn Trap as far as I can tell. During the FNAF 6 fire, Afton passes out. Not dead, but still somehow alive thanks to the one you should not have killed. Crying child. This leads to the events of Ultimate Custom Night that sees Afton stuck in his own mind trying to escape so that his spirit can move on. But Crying Child, represented by a golden bear like the one who crushed his skull, tries to keep him stuck. Until eventually, he throws everything that he has at him. 50-20 mode. After being so weakened by the fire, William survives this attack on his mind, and Crying Child's spirit is set free, hence the spasming bear at the end of that mode. That's him burning as the fire sets his soul free. William's soul then latches onto the nearest thing that it can find, one of the hard drives in the storage room that the Scrap Trap animatronic was being kept in. One that gets scanned to create the Freddy Fazbear virtual experience as the company tries to rebuild its reputation. Then, not wanting to waste the land that was bought for their company, Fazbear Entertainment begins building a new pizza plex on top of their old location. Whether this is due to Glitch Trap possessing someone higher up at the company through the game or someone just wanting to save money is up in the air, but the remains of the FNAF 6 simulated pizzeria are buried under the pizza plex's foundation. That's when Vanessa comes along, our player character from Help Wanted, who reassembles the 16 cassette tapes in an effort to destroy Afton once and for all, but ultimately fails. When our mind is distracted by following Tape Girl's instructions, William locks us in our mind and in the Princess Quest minigame that would later get ported to an arcade cabinet for insurance purposes. And by insurance, I mean like insurance on Vanessa so that she wouldn't easily be able to escape. As Vanny, William then uses the animatronics to dig out his body and put his old endoskeleton in a recharge station so that when he's able to transfer himself back into it, he'll be able to move. After all, at this point, he's not a spirit, but simply coding, which means that that in another game, if he is still alive, we'll actually be able to kill him all. He also gives his old suit some upgrades in the form of Glamrock Bonnie's hands and right foot. Why would he not go with a new, more powerful endo, you ask? Because it's William and his Spring Bonnie suit. It's his body in there. Of course he'd want it back. He's been that way for, like, at least 40 years at this point. It's all he knows. Then, as Gregory and Freddy jump down into the pit, William can sense it. Either because he's an animatronic, because one or both of them are meant to be his kids or something else, he activates his body even though it's not fully charged and tries to take over Freddy. He's not fully charged, hence the shambling. Which Gregory ends up preventing with fire, which has surely traumatized Afton by now, and considering how he's only code, this time fire would actually finish the job. Eventually, the place actually catches on fire and Freddy and Gregory escape. But the blob grabs hold of William. Whether it was to save him or seal his fate is unknown, but this also almost certainly isn't the end of William Afton's story. And it's end glitched. We know that at the beginning of the game, during the main show that every kid comes to the Pizza Plex floor, Freddy ends up glitching and ruining the show. It's as if it was his fault that he glitched. At least it seems like that when Vanessa was blaming him. But ultimately, we assume that this glitch is the reason Freddy isn't trying to capture us. But this glitch seemingly also is what really sets this whole game in motion, and what results in the ability to end with the true ending. Since without that glitch, Gregory wouldn't have hit inside Freddy, and then he probably would have been caught and subsequently killed by Vanny, most likely. Or whatever she was doing with these kids. Like, using them to power Afton or whatever. In at 9, replaced. Thanks to the chat that Vanessa has with Freddy in the parts and service room, as well as the newspaper clippings we get in the van ending, we know that once Freddy leaves the Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Plex, Monty ends up replacing him. I don't know why, thanks to a point later on, but my original theory was that they couldn't build another one. However, it's probably just because they knew he wasn't under Afton's control anymore, and they probably didn't want to risk getting another Freddy to do the same thing, whether it's because of the glitch alone, or if perhaps it's because Glamrock Freddy is possessed by Michael is up for debate, but if he was possessed, I doubt that they would know that. Or if Afton did know that, I guess he wouldn't want another Freddy because it wouldn't be the one with his son inside, which could also make sense. In it ain't upgraded. At the end of the true ending, we have a fully upgraded Freddy with our player character. The first time we have an animatronic on our side, and this will continue to be the case in future games, as long as we play as Gregory again, because Freddy seems to be sticking by our side. Which is honestly a whole other topic for another video. 
Like if we do end up moving forward as Gregory with Freddy by our side, obviously he now has all the issues like hourly recharging fixed somehow, but he also has like Roxy's eyes, Monty's claws, and Chica's voice box. So we could basically do anything and the animatronics wouldn't really be able to stop us, especially because we have Monty's overpowered fists of calamity or whatever they're called. And it's seven reproduced. We now know thanks to an interview between Daco and someone working for Illumix, it was revealed that Illumix does indeed plan to add the Glamrock animatronics into FNAF AR Special Delivery, which opens a whole other can of lore worms that I don't really want to get into, but I guess technically I have to. Firstly, why weren't they there to begin with if these games are supposed to take place at the same time? Second, why hasn't Fazbear Entertainment shut down the Special Delivery project, especially after their Pizzaplex started getting missing children and they know that some kid ended up hacking the animatronics? No idea. And third, if they have enough materials to make a new Glam Rock Freddy and ship him out to kids all over the world, why don't they remake him for the actual band instead of replacing him with Monty, like we see in the van ending? Because like I said earlier, they couldn't remake a Freddy, but now they can once they add these characters to FNAF AR, since they, they have to ship them out to whoever wants one. So how are they doing that if they won't rebuild one for the Pizzaplex? And it's six, good. At the end of FNAF Security Breach, luckily, Freddy is still on our side. Something that I thought was impossible when the game first came out. But for the first time, we have an animatronic on our side and still on our side at the end of the game. I said the games could go anywhere now with all the possibilities introduced by such a vague ending, but with an animatronic on our side, the possibilities are even grander than I originally realized. Like, the sheer possibilities, it's astronomical. This could in reality be the start of the end of FNAF. If Glam Rock Freddy is set on making sure that nobody ends up vanishing because of Fazbear Entertainment again, bro, I mean like imagine Glam Rock Freddy like having like a press conference or something telling people not to go to the Fazbear restaurants. That would be hilarious. Halfway through into number five, possibly possessed. There's also a theory going around, or at least recently going around, that Freddy Fazbear in this game is actually possessed by the spirit of one Sir Michael Afton, the son of Purple Guy and the older brother to Crying Child, who some also believe is in this game in the form of Gregory. While this would explain the brother-like bond of the two protagonists, this theory isn't 100% confirmed, so for the moment, it's just a theory. A GAME THEORY! But the possibility of Michael Afton surviving the FNAF 6 fire and going on to possess Glamrock Freddy actually does make sense, especially given that we've seen everyone else that was in the FNAF 6 fire that contained Remnant still at least partially alive and kicking. Burn Trap is still there, Molten Freddy, Scrap Baby, and the puppet are all in the form of the blob, so it would make sense for Michael, who was also supposed to have perished in that fire to still be alive. Especially because we never see a body. And at 4, sees Vanny. We know at the very beginning of the game, Freddy is unable to see Vanny for whatever reason. Since when we ask, what the hell was that, he responds with, that's a fountain. However, thanks to the newly installed eyes we got from um, Roxy's accident, Freddy, as we see in the rooftop ending, can now see Vanny. I don't know why Roxy's eyes let Freddy see Vanny. Like, if the animatronic seeing you was an issue, why not prevent them all from seeing you? But... Okay. So after the game, we know that Freddy is now on some super mega ultra eye level and they're going to burn a hole in my soul and then make me weep for salvation. I don't know what I'm talking about, really. But look, okay. Freddy, at the end of Security Breach, can see things in a whole new light. Meaning that if he is with us for the 10th game, we are going to have some seriously dope and potentially even overpowered abilities. But frankly, I bet the next game forgets all about the upgrades or just doesn't have Freddy or Gregory in it. Getting close to the end in number three, Arsonist. Okay, straight up, Freddy seemed a little too keen on burning down the Pizzaplex, if I'm totally honest. Don't get me wrong, we love a little arson in a video game context, but Freddy was basically looking for any excuse to burn the Pizzaplex down. He goes from, the other animatronics are trying to help you, Gregory. I'm a material girl. To burn baby burn real fast. I don't get why he flips so quickly, but like at this point, he still hadn't seen Vanny in the flesh. So like maybe his programming just went berserk or maybe something else took over or this could have been William's plan all along. But the biggest possibility is that Freddy has just played too many FNAF 
games himself and figured that burning the place down would actually destroy everything inside. But ultimately, in a number two, operational. In the end of Security Breach, Freddy is still operational. Somehow. Again, despite the fact that he should need to recharge every hour. Unless the whole Afton nearly taking control of Freddy thing fixed his recharging issue or something similar. Unless they took the van, which was never shown in the ending because, you know, they had to run out of a collapsing cave. I genuinely don't know how Freddy at this point is still operational. So if any of you have any ideas or something, please let me know in the comments because he shouldn't have been able to make it to that hill. The charger in the basement could not have been that powerful, especially because he has to get in it multiple times during that final battle. I, I seriously have no idea how that works. And finally, in at number one, ahead of the game. While he is fully assembled and operational at the end of the true ending of the game, in the Princess Quest ending, he's only ahead, since the rest of him was destroyed by Vanny. So, while this may not be the case after the canon ending, it's known now that Glamrock Freddy can operate without the rest of his body. In this scenario, he only really needs his head to function. And interestingly enough, he seemingly also doesn't really need his head. Since in the parts and service room, his body can jump scare you while you're reattaching it. But, like, his head won't be connected to his body, which while it is one of the funniest jump scares in the game, indicates that his head and his body operate separately, which can have a whole other set of implications lore-wise that again, I don't want to talk about. There's been a lot of controversy in arguing over the identity of the ultimate Custom Knight character known only as the Vengeful Spirit, or the one you should not have killed. Mostly in the comments of our videos, as well as in my Instagram, and TikTok comments. However, despite previous biases, today I am here to present all the evidence for both sides of this argument so that maybe together we can all come to a single conclusion. It's definitely not going to happen, but I might as well try, right? <laughs> Actually, probably not. Comment sections never want to agree on anything, but oh well, might as well make a video out of it. Whether or not you agree with me about Crying Child though, I think we can all agree how good Minecraft is. And if you're one of the 141 million active Minecraft players and enjoy scary things, which if you're here, I'm sure you do, you should check out our newest channel, Minecraft Nightmare. A new top 10 channel that's Minecraft all the time. And if you like me and want more of the Cheese King in your life, which we, we should all strive for, I'll be over there too. And honestly, the whole Cheese King name actually came from when I was making my Minecraft account. So I'm super psyched for this channel. And if that channel can make it to 10,000 subscribers before the first video goes out, we'll have a very special live stream on this channel for all you loyal fans. Okay, now. Let's do this. While I may have had prior bias to the idea that Crying Child is the vengeful spirit, aka the one you should not have killed, I really do want to get to the bottom of this, genuinely. So, when researching for Cassidy, I was keeping an open mind and using every source that I could. Multiple things stuck out to me as being commonly referred to as evidence for Cassidy. The final scene of Ultimate Custom Night, where Golden Freddy is twitching after you beat 50-20 mode. The survival logbook, which seemingly contains conversations between Crying Child and Cassidy. The voice lines you can hear behind the mediocre melodies sound like a girl, like the, the ones that play slightly after the main mediocre melodies ones. And William actually killed Cassidy directly, as far as we can tell, whereas Michael put Crying Child in Fredbear's mouth. And these are some good points, and not something to discount. These are also the points that made me believe that Cassidy was the one you should not have killed originally as well. There's also the point that when the animatronics refer to the character as he, they're simply referring to the Golden Freddy animatronic, since Golden Freddy is a male character as well as Cassidy's name containing the Cass prefix, which means curly-haired and Gaelic, and the character of Andrew, who represents the ventral spirit in the Fazbear Fright story The Man in Room 1280, has curly black hair. There's also the two-eye theory from FNAF 3. The two-eye theory states that in the FNAF 3 bad ending, there are two eyes lit up in the head and the back, which we assume to be Golden Freddy, to show that there are two souls inside the animatronic. I do have rebuttals for Crying Child points as well, alright, so don't worry, but I feel like it's important to not only talk about the evidence, but also give countering points to it as well. These are mostly coming from my brain, but after over 350 FNAF videos on my own, I feel like I am more than qualified to discuss this. The Golden Freddy final scene in Ultimate Custom Night can easily be explained away if you do believe the two souls theory, since if it was Crying Child in the suit as well, this would make sense. It could also be due to the fact that he was put in a coma by the Fredbear animatronic, which is a golden bear like Golden Freddy. The he pronoun being used to describe the vengeful spirit is a real 
really hit to the Cassidy theory as well, since why would they be describing the gender of an animatronic when they're talking about the kid that died? Especially when, thanks to the mediocre melodies, we know that these animatronics are just saying the things that they're made to say by the one you should not have killed. Meaning the spirit is really the one using these pronouns, so why wouldn't they use their own and instead use the animatronics? The voice lines sound like a girl because well, they're voiced by a girl. The casting call on Voices.com was very general and said that the actress could lean towards either a male or a female. The survival logbook having two spirits doesn't really have anything to do with Cassidy being a vengeful spirit, and the cast prefix, while yes meaning curly haired and Gaelic, seems to me like a bit of a stretch. The whole name of Cassidy is Irish in origin, and means the clever one. The origin of this name is also 65% Irish and only 5% Gaelic, meaning if we want to go off meaning, we should be going with the majority, which would be the clever one, which really doesn't do anything to help this theory. And the 2i theory has been debunked by us in the past in its own video, and also on my Instagram in a reel. However, I'll go over it here. In an interview with Daco, Scott confirmed that while making FNAF 3, it was intended to be the finale, that there was no intended next game. Meaning that at that point, there were no other characters that could possess Golden Freddy. The lights being on in both eyes is simply because the light is bouncing off the inside of the head and to show us that it actually is an animatronic head that was supposed to be Freddy, since if it was only one eye, it could also kind of look like Bonnie. Or hell, if it's only one eye, we would have thought that it was another Foxy. Now, there is a lot more evidence for Crying Child in my opinion, okay? Whenever I asked others who thought that it was Cassidy, why they thought it was Cassidy Instead, they all ended up giving me the same points. That Cassidy was killed directly, the two souls theory, and the gender confusion of the animatronic. Typically, nothing additional was added, okay? I'm sorry, it's just how it went. So, now let's go over some of the evidence I gathered for Crying Child's case. Cassidy was released in the Happiest Day minigame in FNAF 3, hence why the original animatronics don't appear in FNAF 6 when Henry is trying to put everything involving Fazbear Entertainment to rest. If Cassidy is at rest as well, she cannot be possessing William. The spirit possessing William also from what we've seen in the games cannot be possessing both him and the Golden Freddy animatronic. If he can possess multiple things, then the Two Souls theory helps explain that as well. Despite Two Souls and multiple possessions coming out of seemingly nowhere as far as the games are concerned. As I said, the casting call also said whoever got the part could lean towards a male or a female voice. And considering how Tabitha Skeynes, the actress who got the part, is female, it would make sense for her to lean towards a female voice. It's also worth noting that most prepubescent male characters have female voice actors. Danny Phantom, Timmy Turner, Ash Ketchum, all these characters have female voice actors because they're young. So the same would be the case for Crying Child. The appearance of the Nightmare animatronics in FNAF 4 as well also seems to be impossible unless the one creating that situation, the Vengeful Spirit, had seen them before. And since FNAF 4 was a dream, as confirmed by Ultimate Custom Night, in lines like, this is a nightmare you won't wake from, Crying Child is the only one to have seen these animatronics. Crying Child also dies in a hospital after suffering through the agony of his coma nightmare, which would give him the power to latch onto something nearby, which would have most likely been his father. There's also weaker evidence like the fact that the image used for the vengeful spirit is just a blown out image of Scott's son, which could be a parallel to William's son. Andrew from the Man in Room 1280 is also a male, and while yes, Michael put Crying Child's head into the robot, William was the one who made the robot and also made it powerful enough to crush a skull, whereas a normal animatronic would be unable to do so. Which is what Michael assumed would happen. He didn't think that it was going to kill his brother. Something that Matt Pat also agrees with. If, like some commenters have said, they only care about what he says and not the actual evidence. And while there is more evidence for Crying Child, there are also some things that don't have clean answers. The same is true for Cassidy. Cassidy might not have been released in the Happiest Day minigame, despite it seemingly being the case. The Nightmare animatronics also do appear in FNAF VR, which could have been due to the scanning of the hard drive that created Glitchtrap, who had seen the nightmares at this point, but it doesn't explain the fact that Michael drew Nightmare Fredbear in the survival logbook, unless this is something that that he drew beforehand and then showed to Crying Child, hence why they showed up in his dreams, but that involves assumptions that I'm just not comfortable making. Crying Child does die in a hospital, however, while we haven't really seen proof that you can possess something far away in the games, we also technically haven't seen proof that says you can't. In my personal opinion, the, the lack of evidence 
is in and of itself evidence against that, but I guess I can see why others wouldn't be so quick to accept that. The same idea with possessing multiple things. The whole image being of Scott's son thing is kind of weak, but considering that the FNAF 4 home was also decorated with images of his family, I'd actually like to think that this is more important than we realize. Because sure, using his own assets is cheaper than buying them, but this seems very deliberate. If the images in the FNAF 4 home were supposed to be of William and his family, and they were of Scott's family, and then Scott's son is used for something else, uh, yeah. But people will hone in on how that is circumstantial. The biggest rebuttal for Crying Child, however, is that William didn't kill him, Michael did. And since Crying Child is William's son, he wouldn't want to torture his dad. And while this can be true, we have to remember that Crying Child is again also a child, who most likely saw his sister get scooped by Baby, who got scared when he saw his father putting a worker into the Fredbear suit, and one of Scott's hints from that live stream oh so long ago was what is seen in shadows is often misunderstood in the mind of a child. Even without seeing William give the superpower he needed to the animatronic in order to make it a killbot, Crying Child knows that William is making killbots. He knows that he made Baby, and he knows that William made Fredbear. So getting killed by the animatronic wouldn't necessarily be Michael's fault, it would be William's. Much like how Elizabeth's death was his fault as well. And being family doesn't mean that you can't dislike or even hate those people, okay? Being related to you doesn't automatically give people a free pass for doing horrific acts. If my father was a serial killer, who killed my little sister, and then killed me using overpowered animatronics, you best believe I'm coming back with a vengeance. And also, just one final point in general, in that interview with Daco that is still available on Daco's channel, Scott said that FNAF 3 was intended to be the final game. This question is presented 21 minutes into the video if you want to actually look at the timecode, when asked about which ending of FNAF 3 is canon. However, Scott also refuses to answer that question, because he knows how passionate the community gets, and cites the argument over Mangle's gender as a reason why he won't answer it. He says that it's complicated. And to me, this sounds like it's because what people generally understand in this series would be countered by which ending is canon. The good ending would have released Cassidy's soul, which would in turn make it impossible for her to be the vengeful spirit, since that minigame was in fact not Crying Child, okay? He hadn't been introduced yet. And according to a recent community poll, which actually inspired this video, the generally accepted idea is that Cassidy is the vengeful spirit. So if he had countered that, everyone would have all been up in a tizzy, okay? This was also after Ultimate Custom Night had been released, so. Yeah. So there you have it. All the evidence for both sides of the argument as well as counters. After this, my ideas actually haven't changed, okay? I'm still sure that Crying Child is the vengeful spirit and that Cassidy was released alongside the or other original missing children in FNAF 3's Happiest Day minigame. There's even more evidence for that point, okay? And basically, every point for Cassidy can be countered, whereas for Crying Child, there seems to be some that are definitely solid. Hopefully we can all be civil about this in the comments section, because I really tried my best to find the more, most information for both sides, but um, I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> Whoever I asked about Cassidy, okay, either didn't respond, gave me the same points as the others, or just went on a rambling that made no sense. Hopefully you can all allow for the new information to seep through your brains so that you can see that Crying Child is the one you should not have killed. But if not, that's alright, because either way, neither is confirmed.